everyone. My name is Nasser Zayan. Uh, I am the studio manager at the Hamdan Emerging Artist Fellowship, better known as SIF. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us and welcome you to the first of three artist talks around this year's edition of Community and Critique, SIF uh, Cohort 7's exhibition hosted at Warehouse 421. The show opened on Saturday and will be up until December 20th. Uh, you can book a time uh, to visit through Warehouse 421's website. Um, this year we couldn't meet in person, and so uh, we thought it would be a great idea to share uh, some of the artist's experiences uh, on current. She joins us today along with Sarit Bahar and Faisal Malak, uh, who will be engaging in conversation moderated by myself and Nadine Khalil, who has been closely following their process and development over the past few months. Hi everyone, I'm Nadine Khalil. Um... I'm a Dubai-based writer and editor, and I had the chance this summer to um, work very closely with the SIF artists while articulating um, the texts around their work. Um, so today we have with us, as Nasser mentioned, Sarah, Sari, and Faisal. If you could all please introduce yourselves. Sure, my name is Salan Mehiri. I'm an artist based out of Abu Dhabi. And my practice um, explores the elements of language, form, materiality, and memory. And I'm also the founder of the Artist Talks platform and co-founder of Dara Collective. Hello, I'm Sadi, a Palestinian Filipino artist based in Dubai. I explore spatial, sensory, and interactive installations that combine the human, that interact with the human being. And yeah. Hi, I'm Faisal Al Malak. I'm an artist, designer, and healer. Uh, I'm Palestinian, based in Dubai. My work deals with memory through uh, different embodiment practices. Thank you, guys. I'm having a slight like technical difficulties with the slideshow, and like trying to admit everyone. Um, but just want to let everyone know that this session is recorded and will be available. Uh, later on. And so we wanted to begin with a short presentation by each artist on their projects before we move to some thematics that we're going to engage and discuss and argue about. Um, so who would like to start? Sarah? Yeah, sure. Um, so the work that is currently shown in Warehouse 421 is called A Filled Form is Familiar. And there are 40 plaster casts made out of styrofoam mold, um, a found styrofoam mold. And I casted it 40 times because the 40, um, the number 40 signifies change. And every single time I started to cast it, the mold started to break on me. And usually I would just stop right there, but I wanted to push that further. And every single time I would cast it, I would take a part of a, a part of it away, or I would add something that was native to the styrofoam mold itself. And so it becomes a language of its own. And I'm getting a positive impression of a negative space, almost creating a perfect form in and of itself every single time. And I'm questioning the idea of what is an original and is everything an original or is everything a multiple as it stems from somewhere else. And through the work, I started to set rules for myself um, to create these connections between the works themselves, so almost as a puzzle piece or um, a map or a language of some sort. And the blue tape is also accentuating the negative space on the ground, the 2D spaces um, and the shapes and the, and the forms that are created when you put the pieces together. So yeah, that's pretty much a very brief explanation of the work. Thank you, Sarah. So this is just to be clear, this is the work that's on now in Warehouse 421 as part of the C final show. Um, Faisal, would you like to give us also a short presentation of your work so everyone has the right context? Yes, so my work is called um, Scene for Croissant as a, as a whole. Uh, it started with a writing workshop that we did um, during CIF um, with a faculty member at uh, RISD. 
Um, and uh, we were asked to kind of explore our practice and what were the main themes. And the theme of um, nostalgia and longing and this dismembered identity um, uh, came uh, um, and, and I saw that this was something that not only started with my art practice, but also started with my design practice as a fashion designer previous to that. Um, and I started reflecting and using uh, the different tools that I have, and especially my, my healing practice to kind of go back and explore when was the first time that I felt this dismemberment. And, uh, and that led me to explore one uh, particular memory um, and to illustrate it, first drawing it and then um, painting it in a large scale and imagining it as the set of, of, um, of a, a healing journey um, through, through movement, but also through um, the, the other artworks that, are, that I've created. Um, thank you, Faisal. Yes, there are many different elements of your works. Um, Sari, can you tell us more about your immersive room that you have right now in the warehouse, Terra Incognita? Yes, Terra Incognita explores this relationship between the mind and the body, the conscious and unconscious, and forces you to confront the shadow self of you. So the way it goes, it's an interactive installation that starts off with a darkened room with a spotlight that focuses that focuses on you and your body and then that start that turns off and then you're forced to confront the shadow of yourself and then that turns off and that is very brief explanation that i will give and explore more later so thank you guys and um so we're going to start with uh, kind of our conversation points now and some of our questions. And I wanted to uh, begin by talking about beginnings um, or starting points. Uh, towards the final few months of the program, which is a 10 month long program, uh, you all developed proposals for a researched body of work. And that's the work that is now on display at Warehouse 421. So can you all talk about the different starting points for each project and how they evolved throughout the process. Um, you know, whether it be found forms, a childhood memory, or a book you read. Um, and so uh, maybe we can get started with Sara. Yeah, so the beginning of this project is very different from what is currently shown. And it all started with this assignment where we were supposed to gather images off of websites that we have chosen just intuitively. And one image that I responded to was this wooden crate, um, this idea between interior and exterior. And um, what is also a material that I use quite commonly within my practice, so I think that's also what uh, drew me to it. And then I just started to repeat it. Um, and, uh, and repetition is also something that's very prominent in my practice, but pattern was something that I was uh, exploring for the first time with this assignment. and. I just really enjoyed the process of it and I wanted to continue it further. And so I started to use the pattern on cardboard, found cardboard uh, packaging parts, uh, playing with scale as well and photo uh, photographing them. And um, so this drew up this idea of container and containment and wondering what does, what is it, what even is a container to me in my practice? And I'll speak a little bit more about that later in terms of language, but um, yeah, that's that was the beginning of this work. So I, I think I, I messed up and I talked about the beginning earlier on, but I'll, I'll say it <laughs> in a different way now. Uh, so, so I think the actual beginning before reaching this memory and before creating this drawing uh, was um, a previous exercise that we had done during SIF and, and that led me to uncover a drawing that I had done in my childhood. Uh, this dreamscape um, and, and understanding that um, how I use drawing in, in my childhood as, as this uh, um, healing practice to kind of uh, escape and create my own uh, um, 
mandala in a way. Uh, so, so this is the, my reaction when I uncovered this memory of, of dismemberment was to go back to the paper and create that same um, that same thing uh, again. Uh, and I think this is truly the the beginning of of um, of this work. So my research proposal has yeah. gone through a journey and multiple checkpoints from where it used to be, how it started. My proposal is completely, if you read that and saw my work, you wouldn't be able to combine them. So initially I started off with temporal spaces, whether physical, non-physical, fiction, because I'm always at a constant displacement. I haven't had a permanent base in a really long time. So I decided to combine that temporal spaces plus the fictional mind, which then got me into memory palaces or mind palaces, which is a way that you act, well, you mentally physicalize the space that you're in so you can remember memory better, like in this diagram. So then that idea was then transformed into this manifestation of fictional places. Then this went on to the idea of manifestation of a fictional book, which led me to Orhan Park Museum of Innocence, which was created alongside his book. Then that instigated my interest for Kafka on the Shore, which funny enough was mentioned during my interview with Sif about which book I'm currently reading. So then I took those themes that interested me in Kafka on the Shore and studied them. And then I took a singular theme of the mind and body and did that. And that's very much a lot. That's the journey that it went through. So then I started using interactivity to generate your body into the space to kind of create that relationship of mind and body. Thank you, Sari. Um, it's very interesting actually to see how far your work came along um, and Sarah too, and Faisal as well, though I guess, I mean, I don't wanna compare because um, I know you both had very individual, you, three of you had very individual th journeys, but Sarah preempted this next question, which is around language. Since all of you have a particular relationship with language in your work, a lot of your work stems from or derives from or strips down language. So I'd like us to discuss that a bit more, perhaps not as separate uh, presentations, but perhaps you three can have a conversation with one another. Um, in terms of, um, Sarah, you had mentioned that you looked at the idea of containment, and I know that in the beginning of your practice, you went through all these uh, different definitions. So I guess my question to you is, um, when, when did that decision kind of come to mind that exactly that you were going to take the language out of the work visually, um, if if that makes sense. And in terms of Faisal, I'm more interested in um, the orality in your practice, the sound element, the sonic element, looking at the idea of the first language, the mother tongue that is first spoken before it's written. And there is a detail in that painting where you have um, your name written out um, from right to left as if it were Arabic. Uh, and so I found that very interesting. And then, you know, language kind of enters your work, but through the sound of children's hymns that you remembered with your mother, specific um, songs or, or, or hymns that children hear in this part of the world before bedtime. And there's almost a very haunting quality to the way language infiltrates your work. And sorry, I mean, in your case, um, obviously you, you do read a lot and you are very much interested in fiction and in magical realism, but you kind of, you know, ended up 
in a space where it's really just the viewer as participant and the viewer faced with their own shadow. And I guess if we were to typify any kind of language, it's a, it's a movement and it's also a movement that is delayed that, you know, the, the viewer doesn't actually have control over the movement. You might think you do, but then there's a time lag. So I want to talk to you. I want you to say something about language in relation to duration, in relation to time, because it also, you know, in a way fiction does that, right? It kind of makes us lose sense of time. And I feel like you're bringing that back into the work in a very interesting way. So, I mean, whoever wants to begin, um, or have a conversation with one another, perhaps your own reactions to other people's works could also be interesting. It's, it's an open space. Um, I, I guess I can start. And um, so when I was looking at this idea of container, I would start my day by uh, saying what a container was, container as exterior, container as a framing device, as you can see on the screen currently. And the accumulation of these definitions um, manifested in the work. And I felt that the work itself, its presence, and the title was enough language in itself. The language of forms becomes very prominent. And I felt like a layer of text, even though I experimented with that, was a bit too obvious or I'm giving the viewer too much information. And so I started to create a language of my own through the connections, um, uh, through the connections of the work and the space between them, and yeah, the the picture on screen is also um, another work that I was currently doing simultaneously when working on the plaster, and I was choosing between going forward with the material of cardboard um, and the material of plaster, and I started to see these forms also not just as language, but like shapes and. And also said that they were like animals of some sort, but they all derive from um, flat packaging um, boxes that you can put into these interesting shapes. And they become interesting shapes on their own when they're flat as well. Um, so that's where language comes, on, comes from for me. And I don't ever think of language as plain text. Like if I do, I, I use it as that, or it's just completely something different. It can be a map, it can be a puzzle piece, it can be um, a fragmented sentence, but um, I like to push the idea of what language uh, may be presented. Just to interject here, there's also, you know, your practice has a lot of modularity to it, and in a way, the way you structure language also kind of follows a certain logic, even though it's a completely different form in a way. It's something I noticed in the way that you kind of wrote out the containment, the way you structured it. Yeah, there's a system to the work. Um, whether I understand it completely or not is up in the air. But yeah, definitely there's a system there. Don't be shy. I mean, for, for me, language, uh, because it was at the beginning of this memory that I found, and this is what uh, um, started this this feeling of a dismembered identity, I realized that there is a very uh, visceral reaction to me hearing my mother tongue and that it makes me feel good. And it and, and it these it's a familiar feeling that I, I've always wanted to find again. Um, so, so through this work, um, my first notion of my mother tongue was through hearing it and hearing and my my clearer memories of of this mother tongue is uh, maybe getting told off by my mother but also being sung to uh, and this is something that I wanted to recreate um, in the work uh, through um, singing these hymns um, so yeah that's 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 the language component in and this. there's and obviously yeah, tell me. It's also the embodied language of, of, you know, the practice, which derives from a five rhythms, which is quite intuitive as well. So there are all those elements. I mean, even though you created a sonography, but there's a mm. lot I feel about your work that was kind of releasing something into the world, you know, that even though it was staged, it wasn't. There was a part of it that also kind of went to a place that was improvisational in 
And if Absolutely. The, the context was staged. I mean, the context was set, but the, the, the way I interpreted it, whether through the, the movement practice or through uh, the second layer of the intuitive response, which was my singing, both of these were intuitive responses um, to each other uh, and to that memory as a starting point. It's so the way Faisal works is he talks about a memory while Sara is creating a language and then I'm focusing on what's already inside of you but something you don't know. So the way Murakami writes this thing is if an image arises from the dark inner well, he figures it's meaningful by definition. And his job is basically to record what arises rather than to analyze that. And that transfers to there's a lot of mysteries and metaphors in his novels and it's not necessarily his job to say what it is what it means it's a lot of personal inter introspection and like his novel oscillates between different levels of reality and perception and from our point we see ghosts living in this world we see kafka hiking and then he suddenly transcends realms we see Colonel Mustard, and we see Harbor Soldiers, apparently unaged since World War II. And there's a lot of these conscious and unconscious and these mysteries and metaphors that aren't necessarily explained. And I'm not necessarily trying to explain it for you. So a lot of this has been translated to, by definition, of your relationship with the space this, because when reading this book, it's mainly your personal relationship with that. So I really wanted to introduce that language, not necessarily in words, but rather in the activity that you're doing. And with magical realism, like having salmon and fish running, raining down from the sky, there are a lot of themes that you can say that it is about, or there are none, depending on how you're feeling at the moment or how you're feeling at what stage you are in your life. And I really, really like that because it's still reality that you can relate to, but it's kind of sprinkled in with a little bit of magic just to make it more interesting. And yeah, that's the language. Yeah, no, just just a small thing here. It's definitely not literal uh, yeah. language. I was interested in the durational aspect, but oh. actually, you know, maybe that could go in the next section yeah. um, if Nasser wants to segue into the idea of space and time, yeah. you know. So next, I, I wanted to talk about um, how each of you tackled this idea of conceptualizing and creating space. Uh, I think each one of you did it in a very uh, different way. Uh, and I'm thinking of, you know, the mental space that Sari has created and like you see sketches of in on the slides right now. Um, the negative spaces you were talking about earlier, Sara, between between these uh, between the pieces that you create, the modular pieces, and then also a performative space that Faisal you also set up for yourself um, through like creating a set through performance, etc. Um, so I'm gonna maybe go with Sari first this time. Yes. So just let me continue from my. Oh, just let me continue from the other point. So basically, like I mentioned, this space creates a spotlight when you first walk in. Basically, like you're filled when you enter the space. It's a dark room with a spotlight in the center. So once you enter that space, that spotlight starts to track you in real time kind of like this, but there's no body. <laughs> but it does track you in real time and you're kind of forced, you feel like you have to perform for this space because that spotlight is for you. Even though there's no one in that space with you, you feel like you still have to perform, move your body. And you start to look at your body and then that cuts off before you even know it. So your mind does not have, doesn't have like, it's too fast for you to comprehend what's happening. And then suddenly this digital shadow of yourself starts to appear. And that shadow starts to lag over time. 
and basically forcing you to con and especially in this dark room, I'm basically forcing you to con to confront just these aspects alone. And then with that shadow constantly delaying until it skips a few frames, it also starts to cut off. And then it's just complete darkness until you leave. So you're and you're basically forced to think about yourself in this darkness, whether there's more things to come, or basically you're just reflecting at the points of the space. But it's a very short experience and it's it doesn't let your mind catch up to what's happening until after that. And every each one is less than 30 seconds, let's say. So it's kind of this like forcing you to just everything's too quick and you have to think about it later on. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you say that everything's too quick because I remember being in there and being like, when is something going to happen? Mm. Which probably means I have ADD or, you know, some, <laughs> some form of, uh, you know, like I remember, like it mm. really pushes you to kind of be alone and still for a little bit. And it's also the way you just showed it now, it's very, res it resonates with, you know, Foucault's idea of the panopticon, yeah. you know, the, survey the old sur forms of surveillance mm. in prison. That's yeah. exactly it, yeah. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because your body is, is, is obviously absent in the work, yet Faisal mm. is in the work in so yeah. many different forms. Maybe you can say something about that in relation to space, Faisal. Uh, yes, so for me, um, when I decided that I, I wanted to perform, uh, a big part of performing was creating that that set and creating that context where people would feel, where the viewer um, would yeah. feel comfortable well, to, um, to witness what was going on. Um, do you even understand what I do in life? Hello? someone's what? unmuted um so yeah so being witness that was that's that was an essential part of of um of sharing that that practice and sharing that performance um the creation of space i believe also came through uh through different embodiment um uh exercises i guess uh, and in particular in the the sweat patches where um the 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 two dimensional sweat patches that came as a result of this performance became these uh, ceramic objects that were meant to um give this uh, three dimensional real tangible uh, object that was also in itself a witness of that performance Also, just jumping off of Saudi's and Nadine's point, it was really interesting because a family member of mine um, actually thought it was too long in the beginning to um, for the space to get activated. So they didn't know what to expect and like also walked out. So it's very interesting that everyone's own like time limits and their expectations when walking into a space wow. like that. Um, but yeah, going into um, my work, um, yeah, I've already spoken about how I was using negative space, but um, one of uh, one of my friends actually asked a really great question um, during the opening and said, "Isn't oh?" Because I was like, "Oh, I'm working with such an open space," and they were like, "But you're also in a warehouse, and that's a closed space in itself." And that just got me thinking about like, yeah, how do I actually um, approach? Um, the spaces that I'm working with because in the beginning I really wanted to have a room in itself um, and to further have that um, to further take that idea of containment but I felt like having that one wall and to create that space within myself um, with the work itself it starts to create spaces um, for the work and between the work as well. And yeah, that was the mold that I originally had. And those were the first two casts. Um, and I don't know if there's another photo about how it got ruined, but then it just comes to be this very basic shape, almost all these trinkets and elements start to disappear. And adding the blue tape on the floor was an additional element um, 
almost like a last minute decision, but I felt like it really pushed the work forward because we are showing work that is in progress. And that just took it a little bit further for me. And since I was working with negative space on a 3D level, it took it to the 2D level on the floor. So I was approaching space intuitively and um, with, which, with the space that was given to me, I was creating my own as well. So yeah. It's funny how our works are very adaptable to the space and whether it changes the meaning or not. Like Faisal, I think I remember you wanted this whole theater to create this performance, but then it kind of dwindled down and you kind of adapted to that, but you didn't lose that meaning even though. And even with Room and Sara's work, how it even went from the walls to the floor, you know, we're just adapting in this world. Yeah, it's, it's also linked to mediation and how much um, we've had to mediate presence, which is obviously very pronounced in your work, Sari. And I feel like what's interesting about your work, if people actually stay and pay attention, you know, is that when your own shadow, which is digitized, lags, then you start to doubt that that's you. You know, and I feel like maybe that's part of the, your interest also in these writers who have this very melancholic kind of existential, like they're on these journeys that make them, you know, they're quite cynical in some ways. So I found that interesting, um, you know, that in a way though the, 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 wor the stories are absent, but you know, you kind of leave each person with that kind of narrative thread um, in a sense. So mediated presence was interesting in your work. Um, and I'm kind of also, for the last uh, kind of engagement, I'm, I'm interested in um, first how, you know, Faisal obviously performs uh, the body as a site of memory um, and dislocation, as you mentioned, but also something that, you know, you kind of bring out or, or transcend in some ways um, and mediates through this, you know, theater, empty theater that you're staging and then you film. And I wish we could actually get a clip of the, the sound element here. It's, it's really something to, to experience. Um, but then, uh, you know, uh, Sarah, like your exercises are so architectural. And I remember when we spoke uh, during the summer, you kept saying, I said, well, what's the form? Like, what is it? What's the final going to look like? And you're just like, well, I'm just going to do it on the ground, you know, like when I'm there, I'll know. And, you know, it's like, like you actually relinquish the control that's often very determined in your work. Not that it wasn't obviously controlled, but you controlled the lack of control. So I'm wondering if you could also say something about all of you, about the body, the artist's body as process, um, but maybe starting with Sarah on how that went for you, how that choreography of this, these modules kind of uh, played out in the space where you decided you were gonna have it very intuitive. And the only, I think, restriction you had is that you didn't wanna build something, that you wanted to limit the verticality of it. Um, so maybe you can start with that. Right, even within the making of the work, my body is present. It's a very exhaustive um, process of creating 40 pieces and Taking that already, um, when we were presenting for our final critique, I had them in in a, in like sixteen different modules, um, approximately. But um, it just didn't feel complete or correct, even though I was working intuitively. So when I got to this space, it was it was really interesting to play around with the limitations of the space that I got and started to create the rules for myself. And yeah, you did mention that a lot of my work is controlled and that control is still there, but um, this, in, this intuitive approach was very interesting and I wanna take that forward in my work. Um, I wanted to say something else as well. Um, oh yeah, the hierarchy. Um, yeah, I didn't want them to be I think the only limitation I had was that, oh, like some of them could be uh, standing up, like you can see in the picture currently, but I wanted them to be on the floor. I wanted them to be on the same level or as, um, as the same level as they could get. 
and uh, so that they are all of the same, even though they have these distinct um, and subtle differences between the two. And I guess in contrast, uh, Faisal, just to make it a bit clearer, there's this dialectic between, uh, you know, you performing something that's kind of, you know, just part of your conscious subconscious, you know, that's like very natural, instinctive, performing in a very improvisational way, but yet recording and editing that. So maybe you could say something about, you know, that kind of contrast between something that you wanted to really come out of your body, but at the same time you were shaping it in, you know, material and performance and, you know, like a setting, a sonography that's, you know, has a certain level of, you know, direction from you. Yes, uh, I think for me, the direction was to engage the audience and for, for the people watching uh, um, that to understand and to, to create that context for the viewer to understand what they were watching. Even if I didn't tell them the details of what was going on, but to invite them in uh, by creating this theater set, by creating also, by recreating that theater set in the gallery space, uh, um, by also even singing to them, because maybe uh, th the way that I performed it was in silence. I performed it with my practice that I've been doing for years now, that I'm very comfortable in, that I can um, perform in silence with a particular intention. Um, but for me to engage the viewer, I felt the need, or I felt that it would be easier to, to invite them in, into a space, to invite them into my mind, because these are things that are happening in my mind regardless of whether I'm showing them or not. So for me to, to, to show them was, a, was, in my opinion, an easier way to engage um, whoever was watching it. And, and um, so yeah, so, so that's my response to that. And also, I mean, I broke my foot like a week before, uh, before uh, um, filming the performance. And I thought that that was fantastic, to be honest. I was like thrilled. I, I wasn't thrilled to have broken my foot, but, um, but when it happened, I'm like, this is amazing. This is going to, you know, change the world. When you the, the past into the present, because you're dealing with the past, but then you allowed this injury again using the body as a as a work you know uh, the injury yeah and and the whole work was about feeling dismembered and here i was actually not completely dismembered but you know on the way there so um so understanding also how to to yes as you said to bring that to the present and to embrace that and to understand how um those feelings maybe had limit limited me and how i can use that limitation to create something uh, something else. Yeah, and in a way, I mean, just to end with Asari, Asari, I remember uh, during your process, you had all these labyrinthic mazes that you were kind of choreographing, and then you ended up asking your brother to kind of, you know, demonstrate to see what it would look like because you couldn't obviously use your own body. You were like behind the screen working on the shadow. So it's interesting how you moved from an architectural concept of a mind palace to just the viewer, you know, like using whoever came in or like that would be part of the work in some way. Yeah, because uh, the labyrinth in Kafka on the Shore is a very signifying thing where it looking for self-growth and everything, but it's also easy to lose yourself in that labyrinth. So when I moved away from that, I started looking at this idea of conscious versus unconscious. And the shore in Kafka on the shore is kind of that border between those two worlds, the conscious and unconscious. And most of us are kind of living on that border where we have one foot in one and one foot in the other. So I wanted to kind of figure out how to integrate yourself in that border, in that space. So when you're in that space, you're from this conscious area and then you kind of pass through this curtain and you're in this unconscious realm. So what you see on the screen is different iterations on how to integrate the self into the space. There's also another one. But then I kind of decided on a shadow because Carl Jung says the shadow is this unconscious aspect of the personality that the conscious 
doesn't identify or they're not aware or they're ignorant. So basically that shadow is that unknown side. And basically the subconscious is terra incognite. And the shadow um, is this unknown dark side and this very much this instinctive and irrational and you're so prone to not identifying with it because you're so afraid and you you don't want that. You don't want that to be part of yourself. But this digital shadow that is in front of you is you're forced to confront with it. And especially there is that uh, psychological sense. And then there's also that literal sense where when you have that spotlight on you, you're more focused on your physical body because that's the only thing lit. That's the only thing you see and you're moving around and then that cuts off and then you actually you see another your shadow basically i've transferred that physical body into this digital shadow and in a literal sense that starts to lag and slow down and then you instinctively start to slow down yourself and just for for just for your body to catch up and that's basically that relationship between your mind is so far forward and it wants to do great things, but you're kind of limited in this vessel and you kind of just have to slow down yourself for it. And you're kind of confronted with that idea of, oh, this is not who I am. I don't want to be this faulty vessel. I don't want to slow down, but you kind of have to, and you're basically confronting that idea. And yeah, that's the body <laughs> of the digital shadow. Okay, so we're only five minutes over. Nasir, if you want to go through the questions, some of them are very quick answers for everyone. So. Uh, I mean, I, I'm thinking just with the last one, Abdul Ghani, if you want to unmute and ask it, since Sari was just talking about it, his work. Um, hi. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I was just, um, thank you, first of all. It was really lovely to hear you all talk. And would like to hear, uh, you know, all the fellows uh, uh, talk about their works too. It was very refreshing and uh, nostalgic. <laughs> uh, but yeah, regarding story, I was just thinking of how uh, the work itself really thinks about politics of surveillance and a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, that someone's watching, at least when I experienced it. Uh, but then somehow I've noticed that everyone seems to be recording their own um, surveillance or their own performance. <laughs> so I was wondering if you ever had any intention of recording the participant and also thinking of how, um, how you feel about the participants recording themselves because it's a very interesting um, phenomenon. <laughs> So if you could elaborate on that, it uh, would be really great. So the spotlight was less about the idea of recording, but this idea of, oh, I'm being watched, so I must perform for you, or you're more of aware of your conscious thing. However, there is no recording <laughs> to watch because... I don't want to do that because it is a one person experience in that room and you're solely experiencing that for yourself. I'm not forcing you to do anything, but this idea of kind of them kind of recording their performance and everything feels like it's kind of taking that power back towards yourself from this room where you feel like you're being watched or at least for you. And yeah, it's more of them regaining that power that that control you know from that lack of control in the shadows and everything if i didn't answer your question please explain further i don't know that was great thank you um so i think this is there's like a couple of questions regarding color uh i think mk's i mean mk's is for sara but i think then aisha naim is asking does the color support the emotional feeling that you intended? And I think that's for Faisal. Um, if you guys want to unmute and confirm. Confirming the question on the blue tape. It's, for, it's actually for everyone. Okay. So let's go, um, maybe start with Sara with the blue tape. Why the blue tape? Um, it was actually a happy accident. It was a material we were using during install. 
and I felt like the work needed just a little bit more than what was shown during the final critique and um, again intuitive <laughs> intuitive making in the space um, it was great contrast to the floor it was a great contrast to the white works themselves because I didn't do anything different to the plaster I kept it natural and yeah that is why I used blue tape but and, the and I Maybe uh, Faisal is uh, Faisal can answer the question regarding color um, and how color supports or doesn't support this emotional feeling that you intend. Uh, I know because we've had multiple conversations about um, the use of color and you are very particular with the color. So can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, I mean, color was present in that memory. So, so this pink room suddenly became the pink room in, in the artwork. And it was supported by all of these different colors that popped up in different memories or in different records that I saw of, of images uh, of childhood. Um, so color does support the emo emotional feeling, at least for me, it, it, it carried that uh, um, that interpretation of that memory through, throughout the space. Um, and and I, I believe that, uh, I hope that it also translated to, to whoever, whoever was seeing it. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, yeah, someone was mentioning this, the, these pink rooms and hospitals that are meant to, so psychiatric hospitals that are meant to calm you as a response to my work. So I'm like, okay, sure. I mean, if it, if it calms you, then I'm glad. <laughs> uh, yeah. Then we have a question from Khalud. You want to unmute and ask it? Sure. Um, first of all, I just have to say that I'm so proud of every single one of you. And um, I um, would have loved to be at the opening, but um, you know, I was there with you in kind of my thoughts and soul, and I'll be there hopefully, inshallah, soon when I'm back. Um, but my question is to um, all of you on this panel, but also the other fellows who are listening to us. Um, and I, you know, I'm interested in, in your answers about this. What did you expect before starting the program? So the moment you knew you were selected, before starting the program, what were your expectations? And what did you get at the end of it? Was it what you expected? Was it different? And if so, in what ways? Personally, I had zero expectation is the best expectation because you're never disappointed and you just gain something new you know initially in the whole program i was lost and i didn't know what to do i was mainly mainly just doing things for the sake of you and the rest of the fellow the rest of the faculty and everything and i was thinking more of what you needed to hear what you wanted to hear more less about what i wanted to say and at this end i kind of learned well i got the confidence enough to say what i want to say now it was slowly building up to that during the whole fellowship and i'm very glad that this has led me to that and let me have that platform to speak about what i want to say and to create what i want to create and honestly <laughs> it was great Yeah, same with Sally. I, I didn't have any expectations. I just knew that this program has um, has graduated a lot of amazing artists from this community and to be a part of that um, now that the fellowship is over, um, going into that community is just, I'm really honored to be a part of that group. Um, and something that I, not about expectations, but about learning, I feel like I knew when, I'm still learning to do this, but I know when to stop as well. Um, I used to just try different things, but I think this program has also told me to just take a step back and look at the work, let it breathe, and even during installation, um, doing that as well. And um, I think the artists that I'm surrounded with are now just really great friends. Um, and to have that community together is just really empowering. So 
Thank you all. <laughs> Um, for me, I came in with expectations because I had I, I know uh, people from almost every CIF cohort and I had heard about their experiences and I had seen their work and how their work evolved. Um, and so, but I, I didn't really understand the program. Uh, I thought that I would be there and learn a couple of things. But what it really did for me, because I had this uh, design practice to start with, is that it freed me from the, the, the final product as something that I meant to show, uh, or, or basically only to show the final product. So it freed me from that, and it really made me embrace the process and embrace experimentation and understand that that this was where uh, the magic happened in a way and that I shouldn't be so attached to the final form. And, um, and that was a really freeing experience. And once I understood that maybe in the second teaching week or in one of the first um, uh, meetings, um, that, that really changed my approach to, to making work. I agree with Faisal. <laughs> Even I agree with both. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, I challenged myself. I really went, uh, you know, all out. I, I went into CIF expecting to challenge myself and expecting to, you know, sing and dance and all of that. And I actually did it in the end. So I'm very proud of me um, for, for, for actually going with it and, and, and not uh, being shy. Any of the um, other cohort seven fellows on the call that want to contribute? No. <laughs> well, I think um, I think that's the last question we have, um, unless someone came up with one now and wants to ask it. Um, there was one Nasser that I think will be super quick, but it says, what is the one thing each fellow would like to remove or add to their art artworks? Maybe one word, if you have something. By Shamma. I guess you think your works were perfect and... <laughs> Nothing to be added. <laughs> it's That's not great. necessarily not <laughs> nothing to be added, but we when we stopped creating this work, where we stopped doing this, it's more like I feel like I have for me, I had this feeling like, oh, this is saying what I wanted to say, and that's kind of where you stop. You stop creating. You stop trying to do change it. Although there are different ways to create the same meaning and the same phrase that you're trying to say. Where I was, I said what I want to say. There is the phrase. There is no. Way, there is nothing to add. There is nothing to remove. It's. So did any of you get to the install process and be like, "Oh, I wish I didn't do it that way. I wish I put this in, or I wish I could take this out now and undo this." Not take it out, but more like I'd like to add A, B, and C. Um, yeah, I think moving forward, I'd really love to continue with this work. I, I was really um, worried about the form and like keeping it clean and not touching it and not breaking it, even though some have broken the process. But through that, um, I feel like I'm more brave um, <laughs> to, to do things to the work and not see them as these like pristine objects, uh, possibly add things to them, take things away from them, since the work is all about that, and to see how much further I can push it. For me, I think it was the, the fact that we were in a, in a gallery space uh, that I felt maybe I had to do too much. So maybe if I had a, a more contained space that was my own, I would have done less. Um, this is just thinking about it now, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you added those works at the very, very end, mm -hmm. even after the crits, the injury around your foot. Right, yeah. Right? Mm. I was speaking more of the carpet and the curtains and all that oh, stuff. Oh, well, right. Yeah. Nice. yeah. But sure, these two, if you think of that. Yeah. <laughs> Never stop. <laughs> mm. OK. We have one more. Um, and then we'll end, but um, 
So regarding embracing the process, how did the pandemic influence your art slash art making process, if at all? Should I start? So for the pandemic is they weren't necessarily there to kind of look at it, to see it in that in the physical sense. So it was me more trying to figure out how to create artwork that they can experience digitally. So I was doing VR or anything that that they can kind of be like they're not missing anything if they're not physically there. So that transferred to making my work more digital. And especially during a pandemic, when I my practice involves interactivity, it's very hard to not have to not touch things. And that kind of changed my piece into using that Kinect that tracks your body and kind of went from there. Um, I started drawing. Um, I think this is how I, I started working on a smaller scale. Um, but in contrast to that, the first thing that I did when I could access the studios is that I translated this A3 drawing into a two meter by three meter drawing. But you know, still, uh, this is how it, it changed my, my practice. And, uh, uh, but honestly, having the group and having all the, the CIF cohort and having the faculty and, and all the CIF team around us uh, was fantastic because this was really um, uplifting and, and, and gave, gave me purpose for a couple of weeks during this pandemic. So that was fantastic. I echo Faisal, and during the pandemic, or the, um, there's some feedback, okay, never mind. Um, so I felt like the program also was more involved and having the group around us has just really made it um, a more calming process than if we were all on our own. Uh, but regardless of my practice and my work, I started to look at my own home um, more and look at found objects and started to collect things. And I think that's when the work started to uh, really take off in April. So this work has been in the work since April. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I mean, I think it's fair to say that the pandemic was a few months of, I mean, obviously that changed a lot of things, but didn't necessarily change the scope of the work, but there was the added element of mediation and a different kind of perspective towards studio time and, you know, um, limitations that brought out other kinds of forms, I think, gen generative kind of forms. So I think in, the, in a way it was interesting. I mean, it's definitely a historical moment. Um, but it's not like everyone turned to digital forms of art because of the pandemic, you know. Nadine, actually, it was really funny because when we started to meet, uh, you said, are you working on containers because you're in your house? And you're like, a lot of the, I other, that. <laughs> a lot of the other fellows are dealing with this idea of a container as well. I was like, yeah, maybe it's like subconsciously like affecting our work. Being boxed in, yeah. Yeah, and I remember how you kind of, just kind of walked me through your process of like replicating these patterns and in the end it was something different but there definitely we should be wary especially in the art world of looking at art as just a response to the outside because it's not always that of course there are grand themes and macro narratives that you know the the world responds to especially contemporary art is of the moment but it, I don't think it always responds I think it's often hand in hand with what's happening it's a reflection but not necessarily a reaction if that makes sense yeah I think um this is probably a good place to end um specifically also talking about mediation and how We've, uh, you know, we've sort of adapted to working online, uh, even, you know, within the fellowship, but we've also, um, you know, been viewing artwork online like we did in the slideshow today, but um, it really doesn't compare to uh, viewing the works in person. And I highly encourage everyone here uh, to go and see the show at Warehouse 421. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Nadine uh, all of the artists and uh, the audience for joining us tonight. 
Um, and please stay tuned for two more artist talks that are coming up at the end of the month and also in December. Um, so have a good night, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Thank you.